uh, I had spent some time working on some Erlang projects uh, that were essentially my own, playing on my own um, outside of work. And, you know, part of my uh, thinking about this is that, uh, you know, Nokia being a Finnish company and Erlang being a language invented in Sweden, the Finns and the Swedes don't really get along, for any of you who know ice hockey at least. Um, so Nokia didn't pay very much attention to my Erlang hacking because it's a Swedish thing. Um, so in all of that time, I spent a lot of time doing web technologies and working with JavaScript. Um, and in particular, I was uh, working in the early days on server-side JavaScript because in those days, in 1997, no one did server-side JavaScript at all apart from Netscape with their Livewire server. Uh, and now server-side JavaScript, of course, is cool again, uh, although it was never really cool the first time. It's now very cool uh, with Node. Um, and, you know, at ESPN and Nokia and many other companies, people are using Node to do a lot of things. And so one of the things that was interesting to me was to say, okay, we've been doing a lot of stuff with Node.js, so what about doing something in, in Erlang? Um, and, you know, in addition to all of these things, I'm also new at the Erlang factory. Um, and I've tried to come here twice before while I was at Nokia. Uh, and, of course, because of the anti-Swedish bias, uh, I wasn't able to come here twice before. And now I decided to make sure I would actually make a presentation uh, and submit a presentation. And then my boss absolutely couldn't argue with me. Uh, so here where I am. Um, and this is Lilith. So basically, as I said, this is something that I basically came up with from nowhere. Uh, I've been interested in, in React and React Core and Erlang for a number of years. Um, and so I wanted to play with those things. So I decided, what could I do that would actually be related to video? Uh, so I came up with writing a proprietary protocol over WebSockets. And then I would use React Core to store all of these video files uh, in a distributed way across a number of different servers. Um, and then have a JavaScript client that would play back this video, upload and play back the video. Uh, now, Lilith, I, I can't even remember how I started with this name, uh, but Lilith is a mythological character from Mesopotamian and then Hebrew uh, mythology. Uh, the picture is actually of something other than Lilith. I found out after I had found this nice picture of Lilith. To Ishtar or some other mythical creature. Uh, Lilith is the controller of demons within her own tree. Uh, so I thought that was sort of appropriate for controlling my uh, set of video demons uh, in a tree of Erlang supervisors. Um, so here we are. Uh, this is an experiment. This is not anywhere near ESPN production systems at all. In fact, this is as far away from ESPN production systems as you can imagine. Uh, I didn't actually do my own science. I'm, I'm really not that smart. Uh, but what I did try and do was just try and do random things and see how I would feel about programming in Erlang, how I would feel doing this particular thing, whether WebSockets and video would go together in any reasonable way, uh, whether React Core would actually do what I wanted it to do. Um, it was an experiment. And by its nature, that means I really wanted to do this in a sort of exploratory programming way. Um, and partly that is because of understanding a little bit about Erlang and the fact that you can use the console and so on. It has some ability to be interactive with the, uh, the running program. So I thought that might be helpful. So that leads me on to the why of all of this. Why did I bother doing this? So part of this was just an effort for me to learn Erlang at all. Um, and some part of this is also how do I use React Core? Uh, I've known React for, for quite a while since React was actually a startup um, and had a, only a small number of people. Uh, and I've read about React Core, and I really wanted to see if I could use it for something useful. Um, and this is my attempt to do that. I've heard that Cowboy is very cool, uh, especially from Luke, uh, who's told me that it's very cool. Uh, I've been using Cowboy WebSockets because I've done a lot of other stuff in WebSockets protocols using Node and other systems in the past. Uh, and then finally, you know, I really wanted to try and do something that ESPN actually does, which is to work with video. So what I believed when I started uh, was that because Erlang is a functional language that, that um, 
I would get some benefit from actually it being functional um, on its own. So the functional paradigm itself would make this inherently parallelizable and distributable. Uh, a process-oriented model, the same kind of thing, because Erlang supports uh, a very nice process-oriented model. It has a shared nothing architecture and so on. That I, that I thought these concepts would actually help me build a nice distributed system without having to do uh, too much hard code. Um, it's for you. <laughs> uh, you know, and these, these are basically my assumptions. So this is before I started with the limited knowledge I had before I started working on this system. Um, and of course, you know, I, I work with a team of people. We all work in a number of different languages. And most people look at me and they go, why would you want to work with Erlang? I mean, like it has stuff like semicolons and uh, are gone away. Uh, or they're only in this position and commas are in another position. And uh, then they have periods or dots in another position, uh, depending on how you want to end your statements. Why would you want to do that? Yeah. I am having some mouse control issues. Uh, so the basic protocol that I engineered is written over WebSockets, as I mentioned. Uh, the WebSocket allows you to send both textual, as in encoded over the wire messages, as well as actual binary data over the, uh, over the network. Uh, I did that because I thought it would provide more performance than HTTP and MIME uploads and so on. Um, and Using the event-based WebSocket model on the, on the browser client side is both actually quite nice to use with the browser callbacks, and it's also something for which there are a large number of examples, which meant my client code could be uh, relatively easy to write. So this, the first part that I tried to do, as I mentioned, this is kind of an exploratory programming effort. And so the first part I did was I wanted to get my WebSockets working between the browser and the, uh, and the server. Uh, and with Cowboy, that was very, very easy indeed. Um, so basically, you just write this dispatch table uh, and invoke one of a number of handlers based on your incoming uh, request, and then you write the handle uh, messages that actually do something here. And there's a nice pattern matching going on here, saying I'm, I'm pattern matching for my binary WebSockets, um, and this is what they should look like, basically. So that was really very simple indeed. Uh, React Core was a little bit more complex. So uh, React Core is not the same thing as React key value stores. So I'm not using a database here at all. So React Core is a separate library uh, that the React key value store is based upon that implements the notions that come in through distributed computing, such as having a quorum for your reads and writes in order to read and write to certain replicas. Uh, all of the abstractions that go along with the CAP theorem, I don't know if anyone has either, either knows this stuff or doesn't know this stuff. Uh, this is probably not the talk where I'm going to go through at least my uh, meager knowledge of, of those concepts. Um, but suffice it to say that React Core implements all of these particular architectural abstractions, which means that you can build distributed systems on top of it that are not key value stores. So they can do other things. And in my case, I'm storing video files. It's a lot like a key value store, but not exactly the same. But it has a lot of advantages to doing this sort of thing. And these advantages are as, as uh, useful in video as they are in anything else. Now, a lot of people might say, well, Erlang provides a lot of this already, doesn't it? Doesn't it provide all of this already, like distributed fault tolerance, single point of failure, missing systems? Um, and it does provide a lot of the underlying functionality that you can use. But React Core provides a bunch of other things on top of that, like this. So this is my horrible, I didn't know how this would go across in terms of a slide. Uh, but it's my back of a napkin sketch because I'm really bad at doing PowerPoint type things on the computer. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, so for, for what I was doing, this is basically you have my client here, which is a web browser. Uh, it makes requests to these coordinating processes. And these coordinating processes then figure out where to send requests in this virtual layer, so-called virtual nodes. Now, React Core has this notion of a ring 
of virtual nodes, two to the 160th potential virtual nodes on a ring that are partitioned to accept data. Uh, these virtual nodes can be brought up and killed without affecting the overall uh, state of the system in terms of its uh, uh, failure. So uh, this virtual layer is really uh, a very nice abstraction. So the first thing that I had to do was to work with the virtual layer and implement my virtual node code. And then these virtual nodes, as you can see, map to a physical layer, which is physical machines. Um, and the coordinators coordinate all of the virtual nodes. So uh, the, the TLDR is go to Ryan Zazeski's Try, Try, Try blog, and you'll see a series of templates you can get for actually starting off with React Core-based systems. Uh, and I use those templates myself to do this. Um, and you start off by writing a React Core V node, uh, which essentially means filling out some handle command operations. So basically filling out templates for these handle command operations, uh, and then implementing your own API. So your own API is basically the set of commands you want your actual V node to handle. So in the React Core, in the React KV case, uh, that would be things like a get and a put. Um, and in my case, it's play a video or upload a video. Uh, and that command set is basically your interface that is then offered by your, uh, uh, your system. And because of the fact that Ryan did a very nice job with his templates, this allows you to deploy and start running a cluster actually really quickly. <clears throat> it's not quite that simple. Um, so yes, yeah, so I did my vNode implementation, and I implemented my API, and everything looks nice. And then I started calling the API, and that all looks good. Um, but vNodes on their own um, can die and lose data. So on their own, they don't do very much. So in addition to that, you need to do a few other things. So once you've done your vNode, and you've implemented this handle command operation, uh, there's actually, as I say here, there's lots I didn't understand here yet uh, and haven't implemented as a result. So for example, uh, there is the notion in uh, these distributed systems of hinted handoff, whereby you get a piece of data that was actually meant for another node, but that node was down, so you dealt with that data, but now you have to tell the other node, hey, I got your data, you need to be updated to get this new data. Uh, all of that stuff for now I left completely unimplemented. So I didn't fill out all of the more complex parts of this React core system. Um, and vNodes need supervision. So you need to do something when they die in order for this to be fault tolerant. Um, so something else you have to implement is this coordinator. Now the coordinator is something that actually talks to the V nodes and figures out which ones are actually going to store or retrieve your data. So if you think in the, the get case, it's going to go get data multiple times, once from each V node, potentially. Um, and in the put case, it's going to put data onto multiple V nodes, write data to multiple V nodes. Now, something needs to figure out which V nodes exactly it's going to put the data onto or retrieve the data from. Um, and um, the typical way of dealing with that, at least the way that React Core does it is, uh, or React KV does it also, is with this finite state machine. So I had to start by writing a finite state machine. Uh, Erlang offers this gen FSM behavior uh, that to some extent helps you write a finite state machine or at least organize your code so that it looks like your idea of a finite state machine. Um, so my back of a napkin finite state machine is up on the board. Uh, these operations in it prepare, execute, then in a waiting state, and then you're done. Um, so there's not, I don't have very much to say about init and uh, prepare here, other than between prepare and execute, you have to figure out which nodes you're going to send your request to, uh, and then the request can be executed. And then once the execution is done, you ha are in a waiting state until you get back responses from all of those V nodes. Now this, again, goes back to another foundation of distributed computing, the CAP theorem, and the NRW values, uh, the number of replicas you expect reads and writes to occur on before you will count the transaction as being finished. Um, and so you're in this waiting state, and then once you've got back the right number of responses from your V nodes, then you are done. 
Um, this is not the only thing I expected to do with my system. I had hoped to actually spend some time uh, looking at the media files uh, and writing a NIF or a port or something else to uh, get the metadata from the actual file and then um, uh, basically store that data too. I didn't have time in the end to finish that work and I had never written a NIF before uh, and, until I came to this conference where uh, Omer yesterday uh, got me writing a NIF on top of a Raspberry Pi running Erlang, uh, which was very cool. Um, this, was, this, this was unexpectedly hard for me. I didn't expect that I would have multiple different ways of doing glue code between C or C++ and Erlang. Um, and not knowing yet how important it was, whether my C code would crash my Erlang process, I didn't know which of those options to choose. Um, but anyway, so what I ended up with was a system that looks like this. Uh, again, I can't tell whether anyone at the back can actually really see this. Um, but my client is doing plays and uploads to a WebSocket server, which is Cowboy. And you can see the little Cowboy hat there, so you know it's really Cowboy. Uh, that then calls these finite state machines, one for upload and one for play, uh, which then route the processes to different V nodes. And these are all Erlang processes, at least from this point onwards. Uh, and so they're all supervised as well. So I wrote supervisors for the ones that aren't cowboy. Um, and um, I have to say that it was surprisingly easy. And mostly it was surprisingly easy because there are other examples out there of doing this, um, which I will mention later. So, you know, what, was, what, am I, what are my takeaways from all of this? Well, my takeaway was, was that I was really struck by Erlang, basically. I really enjoyed having done this work. But there were a number of issues I sort of came along along the way. Um, the first of these is that it was very difficult to print things out. So I do, unfortunately, I debug by sending print statements out to a console, because I'm still rather primitive like that. Um, and using IO format and Lager debug was not as easy as I would have hoped. Now, partly the reason for that was that Erlang's way of dealing with types or not dealing with types sort of led me, lulled me into of not remembering what it was that I was actually trying to print out in the first place. So I'm like, is this a list or is it a binary? Oh, I just forgot. Um, and partly that's a good problem to have because it was just much easier using that way of programming where I did a lot of programming without having to really be too aware of what I was programming against. Uh, comes back to the mod ads I guess we were talking about this morning. Um, there were cases, though, where I had trouble seeing that there, there are terms or atoms that uh, were defined in particular places where I couldn't tell where that fit in the distributed architecture. So if I put a different value in here, uh, would my system still work? It wasn't really clear to me. Uh, so there were lots of cases like that, um, which were sort of difficult to deal with. Uh, I was using rebar for this because all of these multi-core templates are done using rebar, and rebar seems to be sort of becoming standard as a make system in some way for Erlang, uh, but that wasn't totally clear to me either. I also had some problems actually getting it working in, in particular with trying to run a system and also compile uh, in quick succession. Um, Rebar, make, devrel had a few issues as well, which I had to deal with regarding uh, parameterization of a multiple uh, uh, node setup. So when I tried to cluster things together, it was sort of that, that was a bit more difficult than I, than I would imagine. Um, and debugging a distributed system, as I will show you when I do a little demo at the end here, was really not very easy. Uh, so figuring out some of the more subtle bugs about one something being written here but not over here. Uh, or why something was broken is not obvious in a system like this. But it did work. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I was really sort of thinking about this in terms of, well, we're working with Node here at ESPN as well as other systems. Uh, how am I doing here? Am I able to do something real here within a finite amount of time? Um, and I sort of have a sideways answer. So, you know, JavaScript code is much easier for me to write and just get it going, and I can write lots and lots of lines of JavaScript and have it work fairly quickly. Um, 
and mostly that has to do with experience. But there are lots of things that I could not do in Node, and I don't even know if they're possible in Node, and I certainly wouldn't know how to do them. And one of those things is writing a real scalable distributed system in Node. Uh, what libraries would I use to do that? Uh, and again, maybe I just don't know the answer to that and someone can tell me. But again, I somehow don't feel like it would turn out like Erlang and React Core exactly. Uh, I've looked at the testing on Cowboy WebSockets and in general Erlang web frameworks versus other web frameworks. And it really is clear that Erlang is great at handling uh, concurrent web connections and really predictable performance. Um, so it's a really good takeaway for me anyway that uh, I can really recommend it as a system for doing web-based video. Um, in the end, you know, I'm not really comparing two things that are very much the same. Node and Erlang to me seem to have different um, areas where they're really strong. And in particular, Erlang uh, seems absolutely ideal for distributed systems development. And here are some of the things I like about Erlang as a result of having done this work. So I'm really a fan of this recursive way of using functions on lists. Um, this seems so elegant to me, the fact that you have a termination when you get to the empty list and you're still here, then you can say that I didn't find what I was looking for. Um, those sort of things I think are really wonderful. It makes this feel very much more elegant than, for example, ifs or case statements. Uh, that you'd see is the, the equivalent in, in an imperative language. Um, and that leads me to pattern matching. Um, so again, the pattern matching is, seems like a very, very elegant way of dealing with, with uh, ifs and cases again. Um, I've really enjoyed programming this way. It makes things so terse and yet elegant. Uh, I'm not just going to talk about language features itself. The console turned out to be really wonderful for me to use. So a lot of the time, my programming style would mean that I would get here, or I would actually find a bug somewhere, uh, and something would break. And then I could actually just write statements at the console and um, figure out what was going on. And if there was something where um, I could inspect values of the variables, it just worked very nicely. And this was actually a nice way of debugging and then also writing the code, which I would then be able to cut and paste directly into my actual application. <coughs> Clustering was very easy. So this is a cluster of virtual nodes running on my individual um, one, one system, so one laptop running three nodes. Uh, the templates for this meant that I could just type make devrel, and it would produce me a cluster of three V nodes. Then getting that cluster up would just mean doing the following operations and then joining them together. So then they would act as the, the cluster together. So that, that was a, a really nice thing as well. So in summary, uh, hmm, this looks like a previous version of my talk. But anyway, um, so I'm not going to talk about data parallelizing nicely. Uh, this is just an advantage of using a functional language, but it's not something that was particularly true of Erlang. So list operations, by that I mean operating on a list of data and then running map and reduce operations on them is good. I didn't really do that here. Um, so I had actually removed this from uh, some version of my talk, but I guess I gave you a previous version. Uh, using the console was wonderful for programming and debugging. I really enjoyed that. Um, and you can see the rest of these, uh, these particular items. Now, you know, the, the question really becomes with all of this, OK, so I had a really nice experience. And I built, actually, a fairly complex system uh, relatively quickly and having been more or less a complete novice in Erlang when I started. So that's great. Uh, but now what do I tell my boss? So uh, at ESPN, we have a very large investment in Java programming. We have a large investment in many other technologies that are not Erlang. Um, and, and I think that you know, when it comes to where we go with this next, then I have to sort of be mindful that, well, OK, we're already distributing video in a, in a large-scale fashion on the web. Uh, why, why, would they, why would we change that and start using Erlang? Uh, and so the next part of my project is really to figure out, OK, what's the story? Why would you start using Erlang? So I've seen some nice success in the beginning. Um, but now we need to do a few other things in order to actually 
bring this model to a place where I can really make a nice presentation and say, well, now you should invest in hiring Erlang programmers um, and building systems this way more generally. And I still don't have the answer to that question. Um, so let me show you, if I can, my demo. Let me just check that it is actually running. It seems to be. OK, so I'm going to choose a file. And you can watch the debugger down below if you really want to. And I'm going to upload this file. And that's all done over WebSockets. And if I show you my terminal, you can see all the debug stuff. And you can see that some of it actually failed. Now, what I'm going to do here whoops, is I'm going to take this, because I need this value here to actually play the video. And I'm going to hopefully play it. Oops, so I need to actually reload this. Bated breath, I can tell. Yeah, of course. The demo effect. <laughs> yeah, it says it couldn't open it. OK. <laughs> this is great to go to my first Erlang Factory conference and then have my demo not work. Just like the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can actually try one I already uploaded. So at least we can have some video playing, I hope. So one of the things I discovered right before my talk while I was actually testing this was that I do have a subtle distributed system bug in here, only I couldn't immediately see what it was. There we go. Oh, actually. Well, anyway, it affects every one of us every day of our lives, and yet we know relatively little about it. There we are. So that was my little demo, and I'm sorry the uh, the first attempt failed, and then we had to go with a file I'd already uploaded. But um, in general, that's my system. So now. Um, I wanted to say thank you to a number of people because without this, uh, without all of these things, I couldn't have done this. And it worked actually surprisingly well and surprisingly quickly because of these people and their projects. Um, so Basho Banjo is something where Rusty Klophaus, who I believe used to work at Basho, or maybe he still does, uh, was playing music in a distributed way. So it's kind of similar to the video operation here. <laughs> Uh, and Ryan did these templates for starting React Core applications, which make you uh, make the getting started part easy, um, and everything else. I think you probably know. And if you want to know more about the basics of uh, the actual architecture, uh, there are many presentations. But that's that's one. The one that Rusty did about the uh, the distributed computing with React Core is a very good presentation. <coughs> so uh, I am finished. Would does anyone have any questions? More coffee? Oh, sorry, yes. So, I'm sorry, I came in a little bit late. But uh, how long did it take you to do the start of this when we had the React Core system? Uh, there, there were basically there were two separate periods of programming. So the first 
period of programming was to get the basic system running web sockets and so writing my protocol and getting the client talking to the uh, web socket server that took um, I'd say under two days of actual programming um, then the react core part was probably a week of, of actual hacking so in total I would say I spent less than two weeks of actual programming on this um, in, in two basically in two parts so <coughs> You know, when it comes down to Erlang's a weird language and you can't do it, I, I have to disagree, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, I found this actually surprisingly easy to work with. Uh, quick follow up. So then, uh, I, I, by the way, I just can't see people's faces very easily from here because of the light shining in my I face. So in terms of performance, no. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question was about have I done any performance testing? Uh, and the answer is no, I have not done any performance testing, but that is my next step uh, because part of my message is really, okay, can I do anything with performance here that's useful? Now, I don't think my WebSocket protocol is a real-world system, but I do believe that people will do similar things in the real world. WebRTC, for example, is doing something similar. Um, so I can imagine that hooking my system up in that way, I would get performance that's the, you know, kind of similar to those kind of systems, uh, and that that might be interesting to test. Now, um, um, I was gonna, there was a second part to my answer, but I've forgotten what it was while I was answering the first part. Um, but anyway. So, no, no performance testing yet, but that's part of the next step. Thank you. Um, I had a very simple there, and so did my wife, and she wasn't expecting it. Uh, it was basically, uh, what, what would the argument be on the other team for why I would be happy with what you did? Yeah, well, I think one part is, is, is going to be a high-performance distributed system that scales and is fault-tolerant. Um, but the truth is, is I don't really know enough about how ESPN's existing systems work in, in that regard. So I may not have a really good message. We, you know, I'm assuming that we're already really very good at doing that. Um, so my message may not be as strong there yet. Um, so then the, you know, then the question becomes, what else uh, is interesting here? And, and perhaps it's nothing. Perhaps it's pro programmer productivity is really the only thing. But I, I suspect not, but I'm going to go on looking. Um, on the path of programmer productivity, how long do you think this would have taken for you and Node to think you were more comfortable with JavaScript? So that's, I'm not even sure it's possible in Node. Uh, I don't know how I would have done this. I would have actually had to think of an architecture uh, so the, I think the thing that's really interesting is the, the React core part where, you know, you basically get this ability to write a distributed architecture just by writing, uh, filling out templates of code, essentially. Uh, and the thing is supervised and it's fault tolerant as a result. And it just works. So, uh, you know, like my, my feeling is, is that that is a big aid to programmer productivity. Now, if I was doing the system in Node or Ruby or Python or something else, then I'd actually have to think about, well, what would I use to do that? And how will I do load balancing and so on and so on and start to you know, mess up the physical and the logical parts of this system? Um, and I'd have to actually think about how to get started in reality. Um, and you know, that may be because I don't know enough about Node or Ruby or Python as well. Uh, but it could just be that this React Core system and everything that comes along with Erlang is actually unique and making things like this work well just comes with the territory, essentially. And so it isn't really well duplicated in some other environment. Uh, and I think in some ways, I already knew that. I mean, so for example, like garbage collection sweeps on the JVM are a really big problem when you have a network system. So we had, you know, I've had this problem before. Uh, Erlang avoids a lot of those problems. Um, so, you know, it's things like that where I don't know that I know enough about either architecture to say, there's one thing really better than the other, 
but I'm sort of leaning towards thinking that Erlang is ideal for distributed systems development, and so therefore it should be the first choice, and then you should have to defend why you'd use any other language in that environment. Um, but I need to know more in order to make that argument strong, I think. No, I didn't, but that's an interesting thing to consider. <laughs> um. That's a random question. I mean, what would you want the benefits of using Allen to be? I mean, would you, what, what's the aspiration when you were looking about going for Allen if you want to replace anything in ECM in a technological sense? Uh, well, it depends. So if you mean personal aspirations, so personally I really enjoy programming in Erlang. Um, and partly that's because I enjoy programming functionally to begin with. Um, but also it's because Erlang is good in the distributed computing space. But now, you know, making the argument to anyone else is, requires, you know, much more detailed knowledge of, of what it is that you want to do and why you'd want to do it. So for example, if we were doing a new product um, uh, so ESPN was working on a new technology product, then I might suggest use Erlang for that product, first of all, because we can get something up and running that's working quickly. Um, and, um, uh, and second of all, because the performance is likely to be predictable and excellent without you having to do anything special to begin with. So we can make a minimal investment in hardware, for example, and, and get something up and running that's, um, that's workable for our system. Um, but, you know, in truth, like I say, I don't really know enough about the real details to say, oh, yes, I should make this, the, the argument this way. Um, but I'm sort of, you know, heading down that path. Well, there, you know, ESPN has a number of different systems. So, for example, we have systems for uh, tagging and clipping metadata along with video clips, for example. Um, so, you know, the, 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 your, your question about w what systems would I have to integrate with really depends on, well, what's the actual use case that, be u that we'd be using this for now? So there's one use case which is streaming video downloads, for example, uh, and that would involve some front-end web systems and streaming files of some kind. <laughs> Then there are other cases where you have an internal system that's used for clipping and tagging uh, uh, video files. Um, you know, which system do we want to use this kind of approach for? I don't know yet. So um, that what systems I'd have to integrate with would very much depend on having a real actual use case at this point. Um, and so far, that, that would again be a very good next step for this project at ESPN. Oh, Jared? If you have um, more than one web server, uh, which platforms do you want to have those? Uh, so uh, the question is, do I have more than one web server or more than one cowboy server? And the answer is yes. So uh, I'd actually been, prior to the actual uh, uh, doing my presentation, I had this running on three web servers on three ports on my local machine, uh, which I think is what caused my problem with the distributed systems bug of some kind that I found while I was doing my demo. Um, so yes, I've run it both with three nodes on different ports on my own laptop. I've run it on one on a virtual machine and one on my regular machine on the same laptop, and then also on three separate machines. Um, so it does indeed work. I'm sorry? Um, so like what, 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 what led you to be implementing B node on React Core as opposed to just like the one you did <coughs> React and then just using it for <coughs> separate systems? Uh, you mean storing the videos itself in React KV, you mean? Yeah. 
Um, well, really, I just wanted to use React Core, to be honest with you, and to see how I would actually do this if I were using React Core. I don't, you know, uh, yes, it's a, it's a lot like a KV system, and you can imagine using a backend for React KV uh, that would do what I wanted to do without me having to write this in React Core. Um, yeah? Well, that's. Yeah, so so I think the uh, the part I think the part that's, that was hard for me was as I mentioned there are, there are several cases where I would put in a value of some uh, some atom and I'd write that value in there, but I didn't know what that would actually really mean in some other file. So I'd see the same atom repeated in multiple places in different files, uh, and I wouldn't know well if I change this, will it actually is it does it refer to something real and like I will actually screw up my system, or do I need to refer to the same value in multiple different places? Does it have to be the same? Uh, things like that. So there were things where, um, where the code had gone beyond its ability to explain itself to me anyway, I guess I would say. Um, so there were, there were things like that, and then I think the other part is that distributed systems debugging is hard, so I don't really know how to actually, uh, I, I don't have a canonical way of going through and debugging where my error is now in my Erlang code uh, for, the, for the bug that I had while I did my demo. Um, and, and I think it would be very nice if you could address things like that in some way. So how do I find out where this went wrong on the ring um, and debug that system properly? So that, that's kind of the thing that, that is missing for me anyway. Any more questions? Yeah, so, so I mean, it's sort of the classical requirements. So first of all, I want to be able to scale by adding cheap hardware uh, and have the system um, deal with that. Uh, and then the other is I don't want a single point of failure within the system. <coughs> and the other is I would like to have the ability to kill vNodes and bring vNodes up uh, and, again, not affect the overall system or affect as minimally as, possibly the, the, uh, as, minimally as possible the overall system. So the, the question was, uh, why, you know, what kind of distributed system did you want, basically? What were your requirements? Anyone else? Okay, I think that's it.